Hello and welcome to session 16 in our class, Basics of Biblical Archaeology. Today we're going to finish up and our focus is going to be on an inscription called the Ishbaal inscription. I was going to try to squeeze in another inscription, um, but I won't really do that. We'll just stick with this one. This will be enough. Um, but the reading that I'll have you do relates to the inscription that I was going to have you um, uh, look at more carefully here in our time in the class. But reading that will give you a good background on that inscription. So we're going to start with a look at the provenience of the inscription. And that's a fancy word to say, where did it come from? Um, we know exactly where it came from. And inscriptions are considered to be um, viewed much in, in a much um, higher way, a much better way, if we know exactly where they came from in the ground. Because we can um, date it. We can lock it into a place, we can relate it to the other objects that are around it and to the very site um, where it's from. So we want to look at that, the provenience of the inscription, but where, where is the inscription? What, what is it on? Um, well, um, it's located here at Kirbet Kayafa. This is the site where the uh, inscription was found. And we looked at this uh, site much more carefully in our last lesson. So that's that same site where it comes from. It's between Soko and Azeka. It's along the Ela Valley. And it's basically in the middle between two areas. One, of course, being the coastal plain. And at this point, it's called the Philistia Plain or the Philistine Plain. Um, and then the central mountain spine going north and south to the right. So in that buffer zone, if you will, between the two is the lowlands. The Hebrew people call that the Shvela. So that's where Kirbet Kayafa is. And of course, it is a very important um, outpost, a military outpost at the time of Saul's reign going into David's reign. And of course, the other thing that's important here is this is where, um, or right above, where the battle happened between David and Goliath in the valley, in the Elah Valley. Um, and then this is just another look to kind of um, help you see this. So the Mediterranean Sea being here and the Philistine Plain here, um, and then the Shvela in this area, including um, the area where we're looking at, right where the green square is, and that is representing our site of Kirbet Kayafa. You can see uh, the, to the right of here, um, this is a, a topographical relief map, and so you can see the hills, the bumpiness, and so the further to the east you go, uh, the more you're in the highlands. So our site, Kirbet Kayafa, uh, and this is going to zoom in for you a little bit more. Uh, if you remember from our last lesson, the Ela Valley runs from the east and it runs downhill to the west until it hits this point and runs into this ridge and it can't go west anymore. So it goes north until this point and then heads um, to the west again. So our site, Kirbet Kayafa, is on this ridge right here right across the valley from this ridge where we talked about uh, the Philistines were camped uh, at the time uh, right before David went into battle with Goliath. And so basically it's right in this region somewhere uh, that the battle with Goliath did take place. Um, and this is a look at the um, model. Uh, this is a model of the site looking uh, overhead um, or more or less from a 45 degree angle showing you the site of Kirbet Kayafa as reconstructed with its casemate wall here and its two gates, um, one to the west and one to the south east, and then the administrative building uh, in the center. So lots of housing on the perimeter along the wall. So most of the housing is connected right there uh, to the wall itself. And it's actually in that housing where we're going to find our inscription. First, let's talk about the publicity of the inscription. Because essentially, uh, there was a little bit of hoopla related to this inscription and its fine. In fact, it went all the way up the tree in Israel. Um, but here is um, the jar that it is a part of. And so there's, it's essentially inscribed right onto this jar. And it was inscribed at the time that the clay was still wet. So it hadn't gone into the kiln yet to be fired um, it hadn't become its final form where you could lift it um, easily. It was, um, it was wet and soft. And so while it was wet and soft, the inscription was inscribed right here near the rim of the vessel. That's not uncommon at all to find. It's, it's not 
It's not that you'll see such inscriptions, you know, every site you go to, and certainly um, there are plenty of sites that don't have such inscriptions, but it's not that uncommon to have such an inscription um, on a, um, a piece of pottery or a jar. But this is a fairly large um, storage jar. So uh, here it is, that storage jar, and now you can see it in relation to people and, and its size. It's not, it's not a massive jar, but it's a, a considerable, of considerable size. And this, of course, is Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, the former prime minister of Israel. So at the time when the inscription was found, he was uh, prime minister, and here he is with several uh, archaeological dignitaries, I guess is the best way to put it. The chief archaeologist here, Yosef Garfinkel, um, so he was the main archaeologist at the site of Kirbet Kayafa. So all, almost all of the publications involve his uh, work and his guidance. Then um, here to our left is Sa'ar Ganor. Um, he is part of the archaeological team that worked at um, Kirbet Kayafa, and he constantly is working with Garfinkel. And then his wife, um, Ganor's wife here, uh, Adrian, she is the one who restored this vessel. And so uh, that role is called a conservator. So if you're interested in becoming a conservator, if you like jigsaw puzzles, this is your thing. You can do it. You can put um, pot, pottery back together, uh, as it were. And she did a marvelous job in restoring this, without a doubt. So um, good craftsmanship. And it's good enough, obviously, to, to show the prime minister. So this is a very important find, um, no doubt about it. And now we're going to move on and talk about the fine spot of the inscription. Where was it at Kirbet Kayafa? We know already the site, um, and we know that that site was occupied at the time of the end of the 11th century BC and the beginning of the 10th century BC. So somewhere between 1019 and roughly 990. Um, that's the date range that I have for the occupation of the site. So within that range, time-wise, that's where it fits. But where is it on the site that it was found? Well, this is the actual um, house where it was found. Um, it's a tripartite house, meaning it has three parts to it. Um, so there's A, B, and C. Um, a is an entryway. That's pretty much all A is. It's um, the equivalent of a, if it were a larger building like a, a temple, it would, have a, it would have a full portico, maybe even a um, uh, columned um, pillars there to hold up a roof. But this is a very small house, so it's a simple entryway. And then the largest room in the house is here, the second room, and the jar with the inscription is found right here. Then um, in C, uh, we have our innermost room. And we talked about this last time, but casemates that are part of the casemate wall, remember it's a rectangle, and so the wall essentially has um, um, two parts to it. You have the outer part of the wall and then the inner part, um, and you can use this for defensive purposes or you can use it for uh, domestic purposes, and that's what these houses, uh, these rooms of the houses were used for almost um, all the time at Kirbet Kayafa. So the innermost room of the person occupying this house would be right in here, and that's probably the sleeping quarters in C. But our fine spot actually is in this corner of the largest uh, room of the house. And here's a really important note, and this will come into play when we talk a little bit later. This room, room B of, uh, of this house, is the largest single room of any individual house's room in the, on the entire site. So that suggests to us that this is the house of somebody important at the site. And um, what was um, we think in here in this jar is probably, or at least I think, is probably grain. I don't remember if the excavator talks about what, what he thought was in there or not, but um, certainly that's, that's my theory based on a parallel we have between this whole setup here and what's uh, found in Scripture, and we'll look at that at the end. So, Building C11 is what it's called with this tripartite uh, architectural design um, with three units, rooms A, B, and C. Uh, and the inscribed jar was found in the destruction debris immediately above the floor in the northeastern corner of room B near the entrance. So there is signs of destruction here in this room. And so this jar is connected with that moment, that time of the destruction of the site. 
So remember, some of the things on the site uh, date to earlier period in the history, going back to 1019, and others date to around 988 or so when we have this destruction. And so this jar, it may have been in use uh, all the way back to the formation of the site. We don't know when it was first used, but its end came at the time of the destruction. That's what the evidence seems to show. All right, and where is room C11 on the site? And again, this is a map, basically a north-oriented map showing you Kayafa. Um, and so the administrative building here, the western gate, the uh, Azeka gate here, the Soko gate, south-southeastern south, gate here, and then right here where this red rectangle is, that's our house. That's C11, just so you know where it is. Um, essentially, um, I, and who knows if you can see over the city wall, of course, but more or less, overlooking the valley below, the Ela Valley, because the Ela Valley is going to run um, this way in relation to the site here. Um, this is a schematic to allow you to see a little bit of um, this house. Um, so we have, again, that um, extension wall that encloses the casemate. So that's city wall right here. And then, um, so this is the innermost room. This is the... Um, central room, the large room, and it has a hearth here, and of course that's um, for heating. Uh, so either you're going to cook something with it, or you're going to warm with it, or, or whatever. There are lots of purposes um, for heating, but uh, that's what this is for. So it's essentially like an internal fireplace. Um, assuming it's used, and usually it would be. A basin was found here, and so forth. So that's our room in our house at the site of Kirbet Kayafa, where this inscription is found. Um, now we want to look at some details of the inscription itself. And this is where it really kind of gets fun for me because inscriptions are my thing. So here is a beautiful black and white, and I don't know if you enjoy black and whites as much as I do, but here's a beautiful black and white um, of the, um, the, pot, the, the, the pot itself and what it would have uh, looked like in ancient times. And so from this, it's even... Uh, more attractive than um, the, the restored colored version because you can see all of the parts that were added to it that were, that were not recovered um, in the excavation. But this makes it look like it's a complete and current jar. The only thing that seems to be missing, of course, is um, the rim at the top. But there's our inscription right here. Um, this is a drawing, what an archaeologist would make to be able to compare it to other similar jars from sites um, outside of Kirbet Kayafa so that uh, parallels can be found and uh, dating purposes, um, you can help date more clearly a certain um, piece of pottery. And then this is an overhead view, a shot taken over top of the, um, the, the, the pot with the inscription. And so you can see the inscription in a circular fashion lining around the rim, not right up against the rim, but fairly close to that rim right here. So if the inscription then was to be drawn out, which of course an epigrapher such as I would do, you, you would want to have a nice drawing of it. That's exactly what was done. And so this is the drawing of what's left. And you can see from this, there are, there are places where uh, part of the inscription is missing. That's not ideal. That's not um, what an epigrapher wants to see. He or she wants to see the entire inscription. So, um, but there are a couple parts missing here and here, and it's possible, very possible, in fact, I would, I would say it's beyond plausible, it's most likely that there is more that, that wraps around here than we can see. So probably there are other letters that originally were here that are just no longer to be found. Um, and, and I'm in agreement with, with other epigraphers on this, that there was more to it than we see. Um, the hard part here is what do you do with these letters that are partial, and actually you can do a lot more with it than you would think. Um, now we're going back to a um, colored version, um, a little bit closer to show you um, what's been preserved. And you can see the area in orange here. For example, you have this part, you have this part, you have this part, you have this part. All of those in here, all of those are areas that, that show reconstruction. So that's superimposing. Um, a missing part, but you can't obviously superimpose strokes that are part of letters in the inscription. That's, um, you know, you, you can't do that with any certainty. But of course, as an epigrapher, you would have the, 
the right for sure to try to reconstruct what was there and argue um, your case for why you think that is true. So the inscription reads um, from right to left as most inscriptions read at this time. Before this time, and going back to the time that the Israelites were, were still in Egypt, at the end of, of that phase, and that ends, of course, in 1446 B.C., they're writing in three directions in Proto-Continental Hebrew, uh, left to right, right to left, and top to bottom, but never bottom to top. So by this time, by 1000 B.C., it's almost fully standardized, and probably in the early part of the monarchy, the reign of Solomon or Rehoboam or right in that area, it, it became finalized that there would be no more writing from top to bottom, no more writing from left to right, but everything would be right to left. But it wasn't quite at that time yet because at Kayafa, there's another inscription we won't be looking at that's known affectionately as the, um, the, Kayafa, or, or the Kirbet Kayafa Ostrakhan. Um, and, and that is um, clearly written from left to right. It's not full enough that we can see all of it, and a lot of the letters are very weak. It's, it's, it's made with ink, and the ink has faded over time, so we kind of lose a lot with that. Um, and it's very difficult to decipher that, in, that inscription because it's really hard to, to recognize all the letters. But that is an inscription written left to right at the same site. So that means that in the era of, you know, from 1019 B.C. to, to, to 990 B.C. roughly, um, there's still writing uh, left to right on occasion. Not often, but on occasion. So they had that right. Probably when the monarchy really became established and, you know, and, and it's like with any government. The more bureaucratic it gets, the more rules that come. And so it was probably instituted as a rule that writing would now always be from right to left. So that's our inscription. And now we look at the, uh, a closer view of the, of the actual um, letters on it that we can now see and try to decipher. Um, so the inscription again starts from here and comes this way. And there's a very important um, contribution made by a, a deceased, uh, well, you know, she made it at the time when this was um, discovered in, in the news and all of that. And she was probably approached by uh, Garfinkel. She was one of the leading experts in ancient Hebrew epigraphy especially of the first millennium B.C., inscriptions from that time. Uh, and her name is uh, Ada Yardeni. So that's a, that's a name to look up if you have interest in epigraphy. You want to see her work for sure. Um, buy the, the books and get a hold of the journal articles that she published. But she made a fantastic contribution here. She demonstrated, and correctly so, um, what would be the letters behind these partial strokes here. And we can know, maybe not in every case with 100% certainty, but with, I think, you know, with part of it, we can know with complete confidence. And the others are extremely rational. So here's what she projected, that these three strokes here, and you can only see these three markings, and, and, and the two on the outside kind of bend toward each other. Um, that represents this letter that is a kaf. And a kaf in Hebrew is a palm, the palm of a hand. And there's a, there's a progression of its original form from the 19th century BC following a hieroglyph. It's actually the hieroglyph that is two arms, and, and for the, with the forearm and upper arm, it's at about 90 degrees. And then you have a thumb and then the four fingers as one. And it's two palms pointing up. And that hieroglyph could represent one of two things. Something that's high, for example, a tall person, maybe a, f a tall building you would refer to, it, you'd use that hieroglyph. Or it represents praise, that you are expressing praise skyward toward your God, whoever your God is. And so your palms, in that case, would be raised toward that deity. And the very concept of the palms facing up give the ancient person a focus on the palm itself. So um, the Hebrews connected that hieroglyph with the palm. And so for them, the palm, the word kaf, it became the, the hieroglyph or the pictograph for them that represented the letter that makes the k sound in kaf. So that being the case, you can see three um, parts to that hand. And it's almost like, an, you know, you can't be um, too clear on this, but it's almost as if we have a thumb as one, 
uh, the, the index finger and middle finger here, and then the last two fingers. So one, two, three, three parts, if you will, of a hand. And again, the focus is on the palm. So that's that letter. And then, um, and then we have um, a pay here, which is a half of a mouth, uh, this part and this part of a mouth. And this letter here would be uh, a ring or a circle in, uh, at the top. And then, you know, it's kind of like a lollipop shape, if you will, and then a stem that goes down. That could be one of two letters. Um, in most cases, just the way it works with frequency of letters that are used. It's kind of like in English. You don't use an X all that often, uh, but there are letters you do use often, like an S and a T and so forth. So the letter that this looks like that's used most o more often is the, the R sound of a head, and that's, that's the pictograph behind it, and the Hebrew word for that is rosh. So the word rosh means head, and so when you draw a head, like this circular head, and this would be the kind of the body as a stick, you know, it's a stick man figure kind of concept at this point. Um, that represents um, the, um, the R letter. And then this final letter she suggests, um, so this stroke and this stroke are part of what looks like a plus sign. And that is, it's very abstract even in, in converting it into Hebrew, but it's a taish, a male goat, and so it makes the T sound. Um, so those are the reconstructed letters. And then she reconstructs that there was this complete um, vertical stroke that represents a break between words. And we see that consistently on this inscription. So, and, and I think she's right. Uh, there's a break in words here. So, so what's on this side of uh, the, the break, the, that stroke, is one word. What's on this side of it going all the way to that next stroke is one word. And the, or one word or what would be considered a concept of what can be joined together with a word. Um, and then um, we have from here to here is a word, and then going on is a word, and wherever that ends. And again, most of us suggest that there would be more here. So that's what we have to work with this, with the inscription. All right, now that I've explained a little, about, a little bit about uh, the letters in the inscription, especially the missing ones and so forth, let's look at the actual um, decipherment of the inscription. So again, we have a cough as our first letter here, uh, pay, a resh or rosh for head, that plus sign looking letter that's the tau here, the aleph here, that's originally an ox's head, um, and then this letter is a sheen, and that's a house. That it, by this time in history, that's representing a house. This is an I as an E-Y-E, -E, and you can see rather than um, originally being more ovular with points on the end, it's become circular, and there's an eyeball in the middle. They didn't always draw in the eyeball. Often they left that out. Um, this is a shepherd's crook, which stands for um, to teach or to learn. It's a verb, and it's lamad, so it makes the l sound, and etc. So um, what does it mean based on the letters that are here and what we can, we can reconstruct with confidence? It means this. Um, according to the fruit bearing of Eshbaal, son of servant of Ashtoreth. So, let's say that again. According to the fruit bearing of Eshbaal, son of servant of Ashtoreth. Now, at the beginning of the inscription, Yardini got it right, what were the letters that were there? But there's one possibility that she didn't consider. What she could have considered was that the first letter, the Kaf, is what we would call an inseparable preposition. Well, what is an inseparable preposition? Essentially, it means that it's not able to be separated from something. Well, what is it it's not able to be separated from? And that is the object of the preposition. So if I were to say something like at home or at night, there would be a preposition and its object. So it's as if in English you would have to write it, um, at home would be all looking like one word, A-T-H-O-M-E, without a space between it. That's an inseparable preposition in that case, if we make it all into one, what looks like a word. So if you take a verb with a, with a participle like this, and you change the verb from a main verb to what we call a participle, where it has not only verbal aspect to it, but nominal aspect, or the qualities of a noun, then you can change things up a little, and that inseparable preposition can work with a verb to create something new. And that's exactly what I think is going on here, that the preposition creates, um, it joins together with a verb in the form of a participle to make um, the concept of according to the fruit bearing, one who bears fruit. That then becomes essentially um, 
um, a substantival use of the participle, one who bears fruit, a fruit bearer. And so there's a verbal aspect to it. You're bearing fruit. You're constantly um, making good things happen with what you have, your resources. You're bearing fruit with it. And you're the person who bears that fruit. So there's a nominal aspect, or it's, there's a part of it that's, that's, that's like a noun in concept. So that together is um, the meaning, according to the fruit bearing of Eshbaal, son of servant of Ashtoreth. Well, who is Eshbaal? That is a question we're going to have to try to address. But first, let's talk about the dating of the inscription. Uh, to where exactly does this inscription date? The Bible refers to only one person by the name of Eshbaal, which means man of Baal. That's the meaning. Eshbaal means um, man of Baal. The text of 1 Chronicles 8.33, which is repeated verbatim in 1 Chronicles 9.39, reads, Nair became the father of Kish, and Kish became the father of Saul, and Saul became the father of Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, that's number one. Malchishua, that's number two. Uh, Abinadab, that's number three. And Eshbaal, that's number four. So that's four sons born to Saul that are listed here. He is Saul's son. Um, so that Eshbaal that's, that's described in the Bible here, that's the son of Saul who later became king. Under his other name, he was given over time, which is um, Ishbosheth, which means man of shame. While Saul's son is the only biblical character named Eshbaal, this is not the only name used of him. All of the references to him in 1 Samuel use the name Ishbosheth, meaning man of shame. Why do the chronicler and the writer of 1 Samuel use two different names for the same man? That's a very good question. Well, the writer of 1 Samuel almost certainly was the prophet named Samuel, who anointed Saul and David, and then he died in about 1012 B.C. So he dies before David takes the throne or Eshbaal takes the, the throne. None of the references in 1 Samuel dates back to Eshbaal's birth or youth, as the earliest one refers to the time after Saul's death in 1009 B.C., when Eshbaal was already 36 years of age. And, it, and of course, he's one of the candidates at that point uh, to take the throne, whether he would or not. Man of Baal's name changed to man of shame later. So later in his life, and that's not uncommon in the ancient world. We've already talked about that in, in an earlier lesson or two. Probably during his adulthood, almost certainly after his shameful acts. So something had to happen in his life that made him shameful for people to look at him with shame, with disregard. And they called him that because of the general disregard that they had for him. And it stuck. The name stuck. The patriarch's names commonly changed as a person gained a name when he or she distinguished himself or herself in some way to earn or reflect that new name, whether that name is for better or for worse. Sometimes they're positive connotations and sometimes they're negative connotations. Similarly, Man of Baal's shameful actions evidently caused his contemporaries to call him Man of Shame. Another factor may have been that between the 9th and 6th centuries BC, any personal name with the Baal element, and this one has it, and that's the, the storm god, right? Man of the storm god. So it's someone that's um, connected to um, a pagan god, and it's the king of the gods at this point in the Levant at the time. Um, but any personal name with the Baal element, it was sanitized from both the Bible and ancient Judite inscriptions. Did you ever have your mouth washed out? Uh, with soap by your mother, well, that's the idea. You're sanitizing. The idea is you're going to clean your mouth so you're not speaking words you shouldn't be speaking. So there was a sanitizing that took place. Ezra, and that's way later in history, the scribe in the post-exilic time, in the 5th century B.C., Ezra wrote chronicles from approximately 457 to 444 after the sanitizing period had ended. So he wrote when texts were not sanitized from names such as Baal. So he wrote the original form, Eshbaal, rather than um, man of shame, which is what later came uh, to Saul's son as a name. The only other reference to an Eshbaal is a contemporary of David, even if his name was not recorded in the biblical text until the 5th century B.C. This strongly suggests that the Ishbaal inscription, and by the way, 
Ishba'al and Eshba'al are exactly the same. The vowel difference means absolutely nothing. Um, they both mean man of shame. So this suggests that the Ishba'al inscription can be dated to the 11th or 10th century BC simply on historical and textual grounds. There's no other time that it's allowable to use such a name as Eshba'al, man of the storm god, who's the competitor to the god of the Israelites, Yehwah, he who is, the one who goes on existing. So they would, they would purge themselves of such names and clean it up if it were in a written text. So almost certainly that name that's on the inscription points us historically to 11th century, 10th century BC. Paleographically, the shapes and pitches of the letters resemble the Hebrew of, the, of that period as the resh of the Eshba'al or Ishba'al inscription resembles the resh of the Tsarta inscription. It's sheen letter, and that's, um, that's the letter that, that kind of looks like a W. Um, the, the sheen letter resembles that on the Kayafa ostrakan, that other ostrakan that's found at the site of Kirbate Kayafa that's hard to translate in full. So 1000 BC for that, um, and its ayin re resembles that on the Tsarta inscription. So the Ishbal inscription thus can be dated confidently to the 11th or 10th century BC. But that's not all we can say about it. The possibility of dating the inscription even more precisely is possible. The Ishbaal of the inscription may be the very Eshbaal who was Saul's royal heir. So that inscription found at Kayafa may be from Saul's heir. Remember, the site's only inhabited late in Saul's reign and early in David's reign. And, and that Eshbaal, the son of Saul, is alive at that time. So it may be that he is the one. What would make us say that? There's strong reason uh, to suggest that, that possibility. Not to demand it, to say it's a very good possibility, if not likely. The Ishbal inscription may be the very Eshbaal, um, who is Saul's royal heir, both, uh, as both names mean man of Baal, as Saul also was called servant of Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth was the female consort of the god Baal, and a father and son whose names each invoke one spouse of the couple, so Baal, the, the storm god, and his consort, Ashtoreth, um, the two in, 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 in pair, um, so it invokes one spouse of the couple. That would be a natural fit. So to have uh, a man named, um, as Saul was, servant of Ashtoreth, that's the female um, of the couple, and then, a, and then his son named um, man of the, the spouse, the husband, um, storm god Baal, that suggests that, that these may be um, connected. So if, if Saul has given his heart and his life over to um, the storm god and his consort, then the same could be true of his son. And it's, and it's exemplified in his name. And Saul and his wife would tend to name him in that direction. As for Saul, he never demonstrated faithfulness to the God of Israel. And this could explain why the Philistines placed his weapons inside the temple of Ashtoreth after his death. So why would the Philistines place Saul's weapons inside the temple of Ashtoreth if Ashtoreth isn't important to Saul? The Philistines knew that it was. And so that would be the perfect place for his weapons if his heart was devoted to this God and they had the opportunity to do this. And that's in 1 Samuel 31.10. Moreover, with the excavator's statement that Ishbaal's central room was the largest one on the site, this could be explained. The fact that this largest room belonged to, to um, uh, Ishbaal, that could be explained by how its owner was the son of King Saul, who obviously would have experienced many benefits as an heir to the throne. So when you are the son of the king, good things are going to happen to you. You're going to get um, whatever you need in plenty. So he probably had this, this ideal house with the largest central room and had this storage jar in it. But what would be in the storage jar? And how can we link this better to Saul's son? There's a way. So yes, there's another reason why Ishbaal of the inscription may be Saul's son, Ishbaal. A biblical text, that's 2 Samuel 4, 1 to 6, and you can read that for yourself featuring Eshbaal as king, may provide further insight into the jar's contents. The two sons of Ramon, the Berothite, the Berothite, went to the king's house 
that is Eshbaal, we're talking about Eshbaal here, went to the king's house during the heat of the day while he was asleep. Where does he sleep? Do you remember what we've talked about? In which room in a tripartite house? The innermost room. That's the room that's connected to the casemate wall. They entered the middle of the building, which probably signifies which room? The central room. The central room? Yeah, just like at Kirbet Kayafa. In the central room was this pot that had something in it that was important. Um, so it, center, it signifies the central room of a tripartite house, as if to take wheat. Aha! So according to the biblical text in 2 Samuel 4, involving the death of Eshbaal, the son of Saul, as he's king, in his central room of his house was a jar full of wheat. Ha ha. So, they, but these two guys came there. I mean, they didn't have good intent. They came there. He was asleep in the innermost room. They entered the central room um, as if to take wheat. So it's as if they talked to the guards and said, we're just going to get some wheat from the jar that's inside the central room. And what does that suggest to us? It suggests to us that it was the habit of the day for at least related to Eshbaal, if not broader, that he and his position of affluence had a storage jar all the time full of grain where it was common for people to come and maybe take a scoop of grain and use it to bake some bread. And if that's true, it makes sense with the text that the guards would, you know, raise their, their uh, spear and allow these two men to come in to get some wheat while uh, the king is asleep in his innermost room. So it's all legit, it seems. Um, they go in and their, their intent, they say, is to take wheat, but they do something different. But then they proceeded into the innermost room, and what did they do? They killed King Eshbaal as he slept. Wow. By stabbing him in the abdomen. So they had ill intent, for sure. In the king's house, the central room contained wheat, which evidently could be obtained by anyone who remained in the king's favor. People probably acquired this communal wheat to bake bread. In the same way, the central room of the tripartite house at Caiapha, which, remember, is contemporary. For sure, it's contemporary. Uh, it may have contained communal wheat for the taking, which was offered in honor of whom? Servant of Ashtoreth's son, Man of, Man of Baal, which, again, is the same name for Saul's son as he originally has his name whose agricultural fruitfulness was celebrated on the outside of the vessel. These parallels between the Ishbaal inscription and King Eshbaal circumstantially support the dating of the site to Saul's lifetime. Even if you don't believe that it's the same Eshbaal, Ishbaal uh, in the biblical text and, and uh, written about on this inscription on the jar at Caiapha, still they're contemporary at the minimum. And that's a very small window of time. And the fact that King Eshbaal had a tripartite house with a large storage jar with a communal wheat inside the middle room of the house may be an exact parallel with the house at Caiapha, with the middle room of the tripartite house with the large storage jar that also may have been used to store communal wheat. And that would explain why you have this, this uh, jar in the central room, the largest room um, in one of the uh, larger sized houses at Kirbet Caiapha. If this is the case, Ishbaal and King Eshbaal are one and the same person, meaning that the Ishbaal inscription undoubtedly would date to 1019 to 1002 BC. This uh, connection is plausible, if not just likely. So there you have it. Um, that is the Ishba'al Ishba inscription that we can also call the Eshbaal inscription, man of Baal who probably is the same man who became king over Israel after Saul's death and before David came on the throne. And so when Eshbaal died, when he was killed by these two henchmen who came into his innermost room and stabbed him in the abdomen and killed him, um, at that point, uh, the process moved toward David becoming king, not just in Judah where he had been king, but now king over all of Israel. He was the next king who would take over as Israel's king, the king of the united monarchy. So this shows you the importance of ancient inscriptions like this, which help us understand um, the archaeological environment where it was found and the site 
and what was going on at, at that period of time. And it helps us to understand the Bible better because now we're seeing the stories in the Bible come to life as they connect with figures in the Bible from the very time um, that those inscriptions um, were written or inscribed. So this is a fantastic inscription, very important, and one that helps us to reaffirm uh, or to affirm the historicity of the biblical text. I hope that you have enjoyed our 16 lessons that we've done together in our course, Basics of Biblical Archaeology. It's been a lot of fun for me. Hopefully you've seen me kind of bouncing off the walls and enjoying all of this, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much too. I also hope that you see the great value in biblical archaeology. It helps bring to life the stories in the Bible when you can see things happening in the ancient world with things that we excavate out of the dirt and, and try to, to piece together and understand and decipher. So um, if you, if you um, have the possibility in your life that you could maybe consider devoting yourself, I hope that at least a few of you might consider devoting your, your life and your career to the study of, of biblical archaeology because we need people to, to it's kind of like um, when Jesus said, the fields are white for harvest. There is a harvest that can come in the area of biblical archaeology. We need more laborers, though. There aren't enough. So um, join me and, uh, and consider that um, as a possible career path because we need to be able to help persuade people that the historical message in the Bible is accurate and correct so that arguments can't be made to connect to the spiritual and, and uh, eternal messages that are in the Bible. If somebody has the ability to persuade you that you can't trust the historicity in, in the Bible, then what they do is they present the possibility that you may not be able to trust the spiritual message in the Bible. So um, that is part of the great value. So I hope you've enjoyed the course and we'll look for seeing you in other courses that I teach um, so that um, together we can learn and grow uh, in relation to God's Word. We'll see you.